Now, he needs his son, would like to say a few words of appreciation. Thank you, Father. Welcome, everybody. That was an emotional roller coaster of a week. Let's just say that. She was very religious, and when Father Rudy was given her the last rites on Tuesday, she joined in, in the prayers. And we're expecting her to pass away any minute. She joined in, in the prayers, and when they finished, she had a content look on her face, as if to say, I'm ready to go now. Ma'am, Mrs. Nan, or Nanita, the youngest call her, was a nurse by profession, and she was a matron in Guise of London. There she met Jerry Burke, and he whisked her away from all that, but her nursing skills were put to good use with five of us. She was christened, so we'll put a few to, we'll straighten a few things with all the questions last night. She was christened Anna Maria, but she got a pet named Nita when she was young. She was 91 years of age. There's all different figures going out, but she was 91 years of age. She was born in January 1932, which was the year of the Eucharistic Congress. And that's how we remembered her date of birth. But in one day, Darren was asked by his teacher to do an essay in class about his nan. So he pretended that she was born in the year of the Immaculate Conception. <laughs> And she enjoyed that. She had a wicked sense of humor. She was very gifted. She was an excellent cook. I know everyone says their mum was the best cook in the world. Ours was. I was constantly baking. And with five children and their cousins and their friends calling, we were very lucky. She had a passion for sewing. She would love making us clothes. You know, half the times we didn't like wearing them, but we had to. But she loved making clothes. And she made Judy's wedding dress from scratch. Very gifted. She loved dark chocolate. And Bourneville was her favourite. And we asked her one time, how can you eat dark chocolate? We were disgusted. And she said, because you don't like it. <laughs> she could leave an open box at Bourneville for a week in her chair and it wouldn't be touched. When we moved from Bishop Street then out to the country to go through, we lost our shop on demand in Dooley's because we were spoiled. And, uh, one time we were in Gautreau and we searched the house upside down, five of us now, we were little detectives, we'd seen Sherlock Holmes, we couldn't find a thing. And we, she used to say to us, they're bad for you anyway, let's have some fruit, that was her famous one. And then one day a priest called to the house and she appeared with a selection of packets of biscuits. And to this day she never told us where her hiding place was. <laughs> Feeding a family of seven and workmen, members to buy food in bulk and baking loads. She bought wooden spoons in packs, and it wasn't until later in life that I realised that wooden spoons were used for baking. <laughs> when I had my own boys, I came home from Mass one Sunday and asked her how she kept five kids quiet at Mass with the look, because she had it. She said, you're too soft. And when she promised to use a wooden spoon, she said, when she got us home, she would use a wooden spoon. But yet, she would never give out any of the grandchildren. And if she'd hurt me, it was the wooden spoon, we'd be killed. I remember one time after I got my full driving license at 17. The rule was when you got the full license, you could use her car at weekends. This pet was hoping we'd all fail our tests because he was, got his first car. So this would encourage us to get a license so we could drive dad for his calls. Anyway, my first Saturday night, got the car, my mum made me promise I wouldn't leave Newcastle West. And I agreed. Anyway, collected my friends and I fit for belly bunion. Parked the car down the slip road on the women's beach, so no one could see the car, there weren't too many cars around that time. All went well, got home, into bed, no one heard me. Sunday morning then, ma'am called us after, she came back from 8 o'clock mass. She said, I thought, I, I thought you weren't to leave town, she said. I said, I didn't. And she said, if you lie to me and say you didn't go to Ballybun, you'll be barred from the car for a month. And she kept her promises. I said, Okay, I was in Bali. I said, who told you? She said, no one had to tell me. The car is full of sand. <laughs> I said, she, she wasn't too enamored with that. She loved playing golf. That picture actually, she won it in a President's Prize and you saw the accolade she had there. But she loved playing golf in her time. I loved the social part. And she played bridge weekly and was at bridge only two months ago. Over 20 years ago, Mamma the Dublin said to me, didn't have knee replacement. That didn't work. Then she got arthritis and couldn't play golf. That she, she loved her golf. And it was just one thing after another. Doctor after doctor, and constant injections into her eye, her shoulder kicked up. And so many doctors that she was ringing the VHI so often, 
on a weekly basis for years. She considered them to be friends. She asked Diamond one day, she said, would the, would the VHI go? Might, she said, if I changed the boopa. And Diamond got a fit of laughing. He said, Mrs., they would throw a party. He said, you have them broke. <laughs> Tracy then became her designated taxi driver. <laughs> About four years ago, she went off on a cruise with Diamond and Teresa and her sister Eileen. And they pushed her on Croatia in her wheelchair. So she still lived life to the fullest. She was very fond of Eileen, and Eileen drove from Cork regularly, and they would go off in, to the silver rooms from, for meals and chats. We were chatting one day about history, and she said, that, that reminds me, she said, we never got our medals. I said, what medals? She said, our medals, she said, for running messages for the old IRA. We never knew that. But anyway, some people probably knew I was shocked. Family was her first priority. She was so proud of and loved her grandchildren. And love from the Carter. They called him to see her regularly because she never judged their decisions and only encouraged them to do what made them happy. That was testament in the fact that all the grandchildren made a point of calling to an end of their own card. She kept close eye on the news to make sure Kieran was okay for, out in Lebanon for the last six months. And while Dan was in India for three months, she would regularly ask, Did he find himself yet? <laughs> she was always up to date on her great grandchildren in Dublin and Limerick. Last Saturday, young Jerry, called, Jerry, young Jerry Cahill called for Kira, and she said, root into my purse there and take my change, and give me a hug. She loved her hugs. I always said I was the favourite child, but we all knew it was really Marla. And after Dad died in 2002, there's another date everyone said, how long has he gone? 2002, Man moved to Caledon Heights to be near Marla, and to be fair, every time John, Marla, Ashley, Laura, Kieran passed the house, they checked in my and dropped in the nursery. Last Thursday night, Laura lost her iPads and they wished that she could get Nan to say a prayer to see if anything, because you see in our house, if anything ever went missing, they would get Nan to pray to St. Anthony. They tried before to pray themselves, but it never worked. But his office in heaven always seemed to take her calls. Then she would take the fiber off for the St. Anthony guys. Sadly, for a long time, Nan was in constant pain and needed carers to help her in her daily needs. She was on about 11 tablets a day to manage pain. And she was suffering a lot from pain. Then last Monday morning, she fell due to low blood pressure and only friends in Mercury and the and Teresa. We think we would have lost her then. Literally overnight, she was confined to bed and administered morphine for pain management. The same money can't buy you happiness, but it can't buy morphine. And those few days were the happiest she has been in months. The happy look on her face when she would see Kira coming towards her with the bag of tricks. Kira's a qualified nurse, by the way, in case anyone thinks so. <laughs> he was with my father's old needles or something. We weren't. Here we were expecting her to pass away in hours. Darren was flying from Toronto and I thought he won't even be in time. People were coming into the room and she was chatting away. The morphine was working, but it also sharpens the mind. And she was very alert and aware. Liam was sitting beside her at one stage and she opened her eyes and said, you're not running, going for a run today. And she said, did you get lazy and trim that beard before you go to London? She says, you don't make a show of us out there. And then closed her eyes again. Again, we were thinking, not too long more now. And then she opened her eyes again. She said, I'd love some rice. Dr. Miriam was there and she said, she's a miracle woman. Let's get her rice. We figured that her brain was so sharp with the morphine that she'd heard ice in the kitchen dropping off dinners, which she did three times a day for the last week. And ma'am loved ice as rice. She made homemade rice and she loved it. After that, then she settled and slept all through Thursday. And at 4.40 on Friday morning, she peacefully passed. And here we are today. We waked ma'am at her house on Friday night. It was so lovely to have family and friends sharing stories. And even John sang songs. And ma'am was there in the middle of it. I called yesterday morning, early. I went into the room. And they were her grandchildren. They're all sleeping in sleeping bags around her. And Ashley said, they were having their last sleep over with him. That was beautiful. Rest in peace, man. <laughs>